We serve a mighty God, don't we? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the anointing that breaks every yoke of bondage. I thank you for freedom. I thank you for liberty. I thank you, Lord God, that you created mothers to give birth not only to physical children, but to the kingdom of God to to become spiritual birthing centers to birth your kingdom to travail to bring forth the life of the kingdom of God to the earth and Lord we praise you and we glorify your name I have a uh, a little um, um, Mother's Day uh, treasure that I've had through the years that I just really love this story and I think it it is so apropos because it sure brings home the magnitude of what God wants to do in the earth and how he wants us to see things not through our physical eyes and not to assume anything but to truly truly have the heart of God to know what's going on in every person's life amen and especially children's life uh, this it's it's a true Mother's Day story um, there was a, a precious woman and she um, stood in front of her class she was a teacher she was a fifth grade uh, teacher and on the very first day of school she told the children an untruth like most teachers she looked at her students and said that she loved them all the same do you tell your children you love them all the same however that was impossible because there in front in the front row Slumped in a seat was a little boy named Teddy Stoddard. Miss Thompson had watched Teddy the year before and noticed that he did not play well with the other children, that his clothes were messy and that he constantly needed a bath. Teddy could be very unpleasant. It got to the point where Mrs. Thompson would actually take delight in marking his papers with a broad red pen, making a big bold X, and then putting a big F at the top of his papers. At the school where Miss Thompson taught, she was required to review each child's past records, and she put Teddy's off until last. However, when she reviewed his file, she was in great surprise. Teddy's first grade teacher wrote, Teddy is a bright child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly and he has good manners. He is a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy is an excellent student, well liked by his classmates. But he is troubled because his mother has a terminal illness and life at home has been a, a great struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, his mother's death has been a hard on him. He tries to do the best he can, but his father doesn't show much interest in his home life and will soon and it's it affects him Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote Teddy is withdrawn and doesn't show much interest in school he doesn't have many friends and he sometimes sleeps in class by now mrs. Thompson realized the problem and she was ashamed of herself she felt even worse when her students brought her presents wrapped them in beautiful ribbons and bright paper except for Teddy's. His present was clumsily wrapped in a heavy brown paper bag and he got, that he got from the grocery store. Mrs. Thompson took pains to open it in the middle of all the other presents. Some of the children started to laugh when she found a rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing and a bottle that was one quarter full of perfume. But she... She stifled the children's laughter when she exclaimed how pretty the bracelet was, putting it on and dabbing some of the perfume on her wrist. Teddy stayed after school that day just long enough to say, Miss Thompson, today you smell just like my mom used to. After the children left, she cried for at least an hour. On that very day, she quit teaching, reading, writing, and arithmetic Instead, she began to teach to children. Miss Thompson paid particular attention to Teddy. As she worked with him, his mind seemed to come alive. The more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. By the end of the year, Teddy had become one of the smartest children in the class, 
And despite her lie that she would love all the children the same, Teddy became one of her favorites. A year later, she found a note under her door from Teddy telling her that she was still the best teacher he ever had in his whole life. Six years went by before she got another note from Teddy. He then wrote that he had finished high school, third in his class, and she was still the best teacher he ever had in his whole life. Four years after that, she got another letter saying that while things had been tough at times, he stayed in school and stuck with it and would soon graduate from college with the highest of honors. He assured Mrs. Thompson that she was still the best and favorite teacher he ever had in his whole life. Then four more years passed and yet another letter came. This time it explained that after he got his bachelor's degree, he decided to go further. The letter explained that she was still the best favorite teacher he had ever had. By now his name was no longer with the letter. The letter was signed now Theodore F. Stoddard, M.D. The story does not end there. You see there was yet another letter that that spring Teddy said he had met this girl and he was going to be married he explained that his father had died a couple years ago and he was wondering if Miss Thompson might agree to sit at the wedding in the place that was usually reserved for his mother of course Miss Thompson did and guess what she wore that bracelet the one with the missing stones however she made sure she was wearing the perfume that Teddy remembered his mother by. They hugged each other, and Dr. Stoddard whispered in Mrs. Thompson's ear, Thank you, Miss Thompson, for believing in me. Thank you so much for making me feel important and showing me that I can make a difference. Miss Thompson, with tears in her eyes, whispered back. She said, Teddy, you have it all wrong. You were the one who taught me that I could make a difference, and I didn't know how to teach until I met you. Warmest wishes. I love you. God bless you, Dr. Stoddard. We don't know whose life we're going to touch. And it's the love of God. This is what Jesus is all about. It's not about doing something to get the accolades for man. It's about touching lives so that they can have a better life themselves. And this is what God's doing in the earth. And Lord, I just thank you for guiding me this morning. You know, they were singing, they were singing about China, and China's always been on my heart. But I never knew if I would... Uh, get the opportunity to ever go to China. I was prophesied that I would go. And then a couple months ago, I had a dream, and I saw the clock. I shared this with you. At the time, it was 341, and it said there was war with China. Well, China is symbolic of the red dragon, and we've been singing to decapitate the dragon. Well, the dragon represents the carnal mind of man. And when it overtakes the serpent, when it overtakes the beastly, actually the beastly nature in us, you see everything in the Bible is a type and a pattern and an example of what is opposing God and what blesses God. And so God uses the terms dragon, which is the carnal mind. He uses the term serpent, devil, uh, Satan, which the serpent, the devil, Satan, all is about the hissing and the whispering and the, 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 the beastly nature of man within us is, is, when it talks about the beastly nature, it talks about the, the opposing force within us that is governed by our own flesh, our own desires instead of God. And so God is destroying the dragon. He's destroying the carnal mind. Well, how do you destroy the carnal mind? You destroy it through truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And when 
Teddy got a hold of truth of someone that loved him, he was able to open up his heart and receive from that person that loved him. And the greatest thing we need is love. Amen? And when, when we reveal the love of God to people, their hearts are open to us to receive a truth. And so as, as truth is being prevailed, as we are praying and seeking the face of God and praying for righteousness to prevail on the earth, and as we stand up in righteousness ourselves, as we apply the truth within our own life, and we become an example to other people of truth, it is catching and we can, we can be a testimony. We can be a witness of the love of God because people see our character. And we operate in truth is going to set the captives free. And so God was telling me that he is bringing forth in the earth, in the earth, a completion of who he is in a unity of truth that is going to destroy the red dragon, destroy the opposing forces of opposing forces in the earth. And this is what God's doing even right now. And he's destroying religious spirits. He's destroying the carnal mind. And he's destroying and giving us a revelation of what the world is versus the earth. He gave the earth to man. But it says in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, that Satan is the God of the world. So there's a difference. And I've shared with you that the world, the world is everything that man creates. His intellect, his abilities, everything that man creates is of the world and it's not of God. God wants us to recognize that he is all wisdom. He's all knowledge. He has all abilities, and he wants to take you to another higher dimension, a dimension of freedom and liberty that we don't have in the world. Our mind and our, and the, our works and everything that we do causes stress and anxiety. But when we get in the presence of God, there is a supernatural rest and a peace that overtakes us that tells that everything's going to be okay. And like the word says in Romans 8, 29, it says that all things work together for good for those who live and are working according to his purpose. When we do everything according to his purpose, everything starts to work out. Miracles start to take place. And we know that they're miracles because we know that in the natural realm it never could have happened. Amen? And so today, you know, I've been... Um, I've been, uh, uh, we've been talking about the seven stars and we've been talking about Joseph and Joseph's name we know means add and Joseph is symbolic of Jesus Christ and Joseph had a brother, his name was Benjamin and I want to capitalize today by the grace of God on Benjamin, son of my right hand because that, who, that is who God is bringing forth in the earth in this last hour He's bringing forth sons of his right hand. And, you know, it's really exciting when we understand that um, uh, when Benjamin and his brothers came to meet Joseph, that Joseph gave Benjamin five changes of clothes. He gave all the other brothers one change of clothes and one portion of food. But with Benjamin, he gave him he gave him five changes of garments. And that, that word five is symbolic of grace and the hand of God's ministry, which I want to talk to you about today is the right hand. And that hand is apostles, the prophets, the teachers, the evangelists, the pastors. Well, what is it? It says that the apostles and prophets lay the foundation. You know, in the earth, really, we haven't came to a true understanding of the power of of apostles and prophets because we have been so accustomed to a religious ceremony and and programs and a setup of man's order instead of God's spiritual order that he wants to set up in the earth and the prophets basically they're troubleshooters they not only exhort you but they also correct and instruct and they're they are God's mouthpiece of what God wants to do in the earth it's not their decisions. It's not 
their thoughts, it's not their mind, it's God's mind. And it's, they're just a delivery system from what God wants to say in the earth. And the apostolic operates in all five folds, so the apostolic can not only execute it, it's like a main CEO of a, a builder, a builder that does great commercial buildings. They know how to implement a building from the foundation all the way to its finished product. Well, so that is an apostle. Apostle knows how he, they see the, the treasures within you. They see your abilities in the spirit to bring those treasures out. That's why it's so important to be a part of the body of Christ. Why? Because the more you are a disciple of Christ, the more you're discipled and trained in God, you are training your spirit man to grow up in the fullness of Christ so that, that you can understand and you can relate to others that have the same calling you do. And you see, the more, the more you are trained in the spirit, the more you see others operate in the spirit, the more your spirit's going to gravitate to one of those five ministries that are going to overtake you and cause you to say, hey, that's me. Hey, that anointing is me. And I can relate to them. You know, people that have a pastoral anointing will be gathered. They will be, uh, uh, they'll, they'll feel a closeness to people that are pastoral. Evangelistic people people that like to go out and evangelize you know mark's evangelistic and he likes to go out and he likes to talk to people and share the gospel and um and, and steve's very evangelistic but then there you have then you have the um um what am i missing um the prophets which execute god's word the apostles who can carry out and build the kingdom of God, the prophets also help do that because it says that the apostles and the prophets lay the foundation. And um, teachers, that's what I'm missing. I was thinking teachers. And then the teachers, the people, now Steve's a teacher because I make him nuts. You see, I go and I hit the high points and then he wants to fill in all the gaps. Well, that's what a teacher does. A teacher fills in the gaps. It's, I'm prophetic, so, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you're preaching over my head. I purposely preach over your head because I'm not preaching to your head. I'm preaching to your spirit. And you see, legalistic people, people that like to, you know, they, 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 they want to know everything, okay? Okay, that's not God because God's not speaking to you in the natural, in your intellect for information, He's speaking to grow your spirit man, to grow you up in Christ that supersedes your mind, that supersedes your ability. So quit trying to learn something through information. God's more interested in you taking one part of this message that captivates you and sit on it and grow on it than try to learn everything I'm saying. You're not going to. Why? Because the word of God is caught. It's not taught. And so I'm training your spirit man to grow up in your true identity in Christ Jesus. And your mind blocks God's purposes in your life. It, it puts up barriers because it's trying to figure out spiritual wisdom through the natural man. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says that the natural man cannot, cannot understand the things of the spirit. And that's why people get confused. That's why people get, dis, get dis, you know, discombobulated because they're trying to understand spiritual things in their natural physical mind. And you can't. It doesn't work. And years ago, the Lord taught me, just take what I'm wanting to teach you at this time and grow on that. And I will open the doors and continue to grow and cause the puzzle to come all together. But just take what I give you, eat it, devour it, enjoy it, and be excited about what I'm giving you. And from that, I will build. And he, God is the foundation. He, is, he lays the foundation. And, 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 it, and he gave apostles and prophets to lay the foundation. But Jesus Christ is the foundation. 
Well, if he's the foundation, the Bible says, <coughs> excuse me, that, that upon the foundation, we are going to become living stones. Um, Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 11, so you know where I'm coming from. It says, he gave some as apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. So you are going to be drawn to people of the same like spirit to grow. And so you're going to be, you're going to be challenged through their calling and anointing of those people that are mature in these areas. And then verse 12 says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the service to the building up of the body of Christ. God wants to build you up in his body, but he builds you up through spirit. So the more you spend quality time in the spirit and praying in the spirit, your spirit man is going to be grown up and he's going to take you beyond your mind. How many times have you had prayers that you needed answers because you didn't know the answer, okay? God gave you the Holy Spirit so that you can get the answer. But it takes giving him quality time, and you need to be trained in praying in the Spirit and then listening. You ask the Holy Spirit, you pray in the Spirit, and then you wait for him to tell you exactly the answer. And he does, you know? We've been asking him, you know, um, I've gotten some really <laughs> tough hits because the Lord, we asked the Lord about Russia because we go to Russia. We have a church in Russia, in Moscow, and we've asked the Lord, Lord, you know, is Putin bad? Is he killing people? Is he doing evil things? And the Lord showed us, the Lord showed us that Putin was purging the nation of the Ukraine from all the corruption and where a lot of the, the um, uh, virus, the COVID, it was a bioweapon. They proved it was a bioweapon and a lot of it was created right there in Ukraine because it's the most, one of the most corrupt nations in the earth. And we know, that, we know that a lot of our government, they had business with, some of the companies, and I knew this years ago, you've got about four governmental people that are in, in business in Ukraine. And it's all evil, nefarious deeds, and it's laundering money. It's, it's trafficking children. It's laboratories that created this, va this, uh, this uh, um, virus. And also, it is the hub of a lot of the deep state's corruption. And that's why there's so much opposition. And so they're making it look like he's killing all the civilians when in actuality it's their evil organizations that have no heart, they have no problem killing people for their own safety and protection and cover-up, and they're killing innocent people <coughs> to make it look like Putin's done it. And the Lord has showed, this, showed us this. Steve had a vision just, in fact, the Lord spoke to us through the months ever since this started to happen. And we said, Lord, we want to confirm, we want you to confirm in our hearts that Putin is right and we're lifting him up because he is doing your deed. He is purging the nation of evil people. And uh, anyway, Steve had a vision while we were praying, a, a, what is it, a week or, week or so ago, and um, Steve, what was the vision? You were, you were, yeah, I was studying, and we were back in Russia. Said, you're not going to have, uh, you're not going to have supper. 
That was a prior, yeah. The Americans. Did everybody hear that? It's powerful, you know. See, God is the news. And this is the corruption of man to cover up their evil deeds and destroy innocent people to protect themselves. This is what God's tearing down. He's destroying Babylon. And um, Roxy, well, we were praying the other night. The Lord spoke to Roxy. And the, ess the essence of it was is that we are coming to the end of an error. We're coming to the end of an error. We're coming to the end of corruption and evil. And righteousness is going to prevail. God's going to have a people that are righteous to declare his kingdom in the earth. And a prophetic voice is going to arise in the earth. And it's exciting when we, when we understand that God is in control of everything. You know, a lot of times we don't see God, so we think he's not in control. But he is working through a people, and he's wanting to grow up a people to be a governmental authority of his voice in the earth. And we really haven't seen it for many years. We saw it when Jesus came and he was birthed and, and Mary birthed Jesus. And we saw his walk on the earth of his first coming. And we saw him grow up. And we saw the kingdom of God come in power and in miracles and signs and wonders. And then he trained up 12 disciples and one of them uh, 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 betrayed him. But 3,000 were added after Jesus died and arose from the dead. And the disciples went to the upper room. <coughs> excuse me, to be filled with the Spirit. It wasn't until they were filled with the Spirit. You see, Jesus said, I'm going to go, and when I go, I want you to tarry here because I'm going to the Father, and I'm going to be consummated in, in my transformation. You see, Jesus came to this earth to undo what the first Adam did. He came to bring us back to this place of victory. He, he, he sent his son to bring us back to the place of righteousness. He sent his son that we might have dominion and authority made in his likeness to rule and reign in the earth. And he's going to have a people and this is what he's preparing now. And to those people who want to get serious, if you want to work nine to five and just work to have a house and a car and have a happy life, God doesn't have a chain around your ankles. But I'm here to tell you that there's a greater purpose for you than working nine to five. And, and you know, it's exciting because I was in the religious church. I was in the system. And I asked Jesus in my heart and I got filled with the Spirit. But I knew there, there was something more. And the church was not giving me the whole story. And I was... I was pondering and asking Lord show me show me show me the truth of the word of the living God and as I pondered and as I wa waited upon the Lord when he took me over to Ukraine he started teaching me he goes if you're willing to be wrong I can teach you anything see we have I came up Methodist you know and they were against the baptism of the Holy Spirit there's a lot of denominations that are against the Holy Spirit and I you know why they're against the Holy Spirit because it makes you accountable and responsible. It takes you to a place of the unknown. It takes you out of your control. It takes you out of depending on you and learning to be the, the offspring 
the child of God that he created you to be that supersedes the very work and the stress and the anxiety that you're living to to be blessed in. He has the ability to take you above it, beyond it. But you see, we are so determined because of our egos, because of our insecurities, because we want to be successful in this world. Come on. And who gives a rip about your success? When you're sick and you need help, who's around? Are you hearing me? You see, we're always trying to impress other people that don't really care about us because of what we have been embedded in. The world and the system of success and, and works and who are you? Doctor, lawyer, or Indian chief. You know, you know, everyone's always trying to impress someone else and all it does is cause anxiety and stress. But when we get in the presence of God, he takes us beyond the, our identity of who we think we have to be to an identity that he created us to be before the foundation of the world that brings fulfillment. You know, I didn't find this until I was in my 30s. I didn't find this truth out until God, I allowed God to change me. I allowed God to teach me. I allowed God to do whatever he wanted in my life that I would find truth. Because you see, the Lord, he, always, he told Moses, he told Abraham, and well, he actually, he started with Moses. He told Moses, he said, the only thing I want you to celebrate is the feast. And that's, the, that, so many people think, oh, that's a Jewish tradition. It was from the beginning. When they came out of Egypt, God was showing them a pattern. And the feast represent salvation. They represent the baptism of the Spirit. And the third, fe- the third feast represents the fullness of the Spirit overcoming death, hell, and the grave in which we sing about all the time. But because the church hasn't been taught it, they don't understand. It says the last enemy to overcome is death. Isn't it amazing that in Romans 8.23, it says that we're anxiously awaiting the redemption, the glorification of our bodies. That means that our bodies overcome death. That, he didn't say, I want you waiting for you to go to heaven. The patriarchs, is not, they're not complete. The patriarchs are waiting for a people that are alive to fulfill God's plan and purpose for all humanity. There is a, in, in, if you go to the, the descendants, there's, there's 24 um, uh, generations the 24th generation in Matthew the first chapter hasn't been fulfilled yet why because there's still a generation that has not been born yet come on that is going to fulfill tabernacles that is going to overcome death that's the 24th generation and it has it wasn't put in the Bible because it hasn't happened yet and you can go through it. There's 24 generations from Jesus. That's, and there's going to be a fulfillment. And the patriarchs in Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, they're anxiously, they're waiting for you and me, for a people to be perfected. And that word perfected, come on, is the fullness of Christ. And isn't it amazing? And you can look in Ephesians 4:13. That's the whole purpose of the church. My purpose is to show you, disciple you, train you to overcome death in you, to stop looking in the world, to stop depending in the world, to stop depending on your intellect, to stop depending on your senses and your will and your ways and start to learn to depend on Jesus Christ so that you can overcome death, so that you can be a part of the army of God and rule and reign in the earth for a thousand years. Now you can... You can continue to do your own thing. God's not going to stop you. But you're, you're going to miss out on being part of the army of God and the first resurrection. And for a thousand years, for a thousand years, you have to wait to get your new body, your glorified body, because you chose to do it your way instead of God's way. So you see, you know a truth now that you didn't know before. 
And you have the opportunity to grow up in Christ Jesus and find out your destiny. Most, most of the government and the businessmen that I met in Ukraine, I told them, most of you guys are apostolic. Why? Because they, they multitask. They have great minds and they have big businesses. They have abilities to do many things. Well, when we transition from the world, I was a multitasker. I can do a lot of different things at the same time. But I was using my energy to build Steve and our business for money, okay? Then we end up losing it. Come on, why? Because God wanted to reveal his power to us. He wanted to reveal that he was our finances. He wanted to reveal that he was our source. He wanted to reveal that he is the house. And he wants me to house him. Are you hearing me? Come on, are you getting this? You see, the Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That word temple is habitation. It means dwelling place. It means sanctuary. It also means tabernacle. Jesus wants me and you to be his tabernacle in the earth. His dwelling place. Now, let's look at the feasts again and you'll get a better understanding. He sent his son that we would be saved. Our spirit would be woke up to who we truly are as his temple, his tabernacle. Then he sent his son not only to die, but he was no longer physical when he died. He was no longer human when he died. He came and tabernacled in humanity and flesh. But when he died, he broke the curse, destroyed death, hell, and the grave, and transformed into spirit. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. Because it is Christ now dwelling in us as his habitation, dwelling place, sanctuary, temple, tabernacle. Are you getting this? And so when God sent his son and Jesus transformed into spirit, Galatians 4, 6, Galatians 4, 6 tells us God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts that we can cry, Abba. You can't cry, Abba, unless you know him as Father, Father God. To know, to know him, to know him as Father, you have to go beyond the veil. The veil is in the second room. Come on. And that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit is it's not about the getting tongues, blah, 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 blah. It's not about speaking in tongues. It's about being full of the Spirit. It's about what the tongues takes you to. It takes you to the Father. It takes you beyond your head. It takes you beyond your wisdom. It takes you beyond your knowledge. It takes you beyond everything of this world. And it connects you to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the Father. And in them, we can do all things. Then the impossible happens. Why? Because he does the supernatural. Who split the Red Sea? Who split the Red Sea? He gave Moses instructions. He's wanting to give a people instructions to part the Red Sea in your life, to part the Red Sea in other people's lives, to bring miracles to Ecuador, to bring miracles to uh, Venezuela, to bring miracles to Russia, to Ukraine, that all peoples can see him as he is. So here we see the feast. They're, they're spoken in different ways, but they say the same thing. So in the first room in the outer court, we meet Jesus. In the second room, we meet the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And in the third room, we meet the Father. But we can't meet the Father and consummate with the Father until we are willing to go through the veil. The veil is our flesh. The veil is our worldly senses, our desires, our intellect, and the dependency on us. I'm going to do it my way. But when we give ourselves up and we lay our lives down, 
then the Holy Spirit as we are praying in the Spirit. And the more we pray and we focus in the Spirit, the Spirit takes over and gives us answers, supernatural abilities. He opens doors that are impossible to open. He gives us the keys to his kingdom. I, I can remember God doing a supernatural work. We went to Moscow for the first time, and it was in the middle of the night. It was like midnight, and we had got off the plane, and we went on the uh, we went on the um, bus to downtown Moscow, and we had to get on the the underground subway, and there. Um, escalators oh, because they move so many hundreds and hundreds of people so fast because Moscow has like 10 high lanes of highway they have like there it's beyond it's bigger than New York okay and there's so many thousands of people traveling in the subway and so I had another minister with me and then I had three other ministers uh, from Ukraine and they had all of our luggage and dummy me I always carry too much and so anyway we had to go down the escalator and so I had a lot of my stuff and then one of the ministers had a bunch of stuff but they forgot one of my suitcases and all I can remember is you can't leave anything because it'll be gone and so here I had this huge suitcase and I'm going the guys were all on the escalator and it's just me and there I, my arms are full I just grabbed it and I threw it on the escalator when I threw it on the escalator it blocked the escalator and it stopped it and everyone jerked back and I fell backwards <laughs> I fell backwards <clears throat> anyway we end up walking down the escalator and the guys got my suitcase <clears throat> so anyway we're going to go get on a bus and we had some of the team was worship. There were worship team. And one of the guys put his guitar up in the bus, up on the top. They have these lev ledges. And they, he put it up. He was so worried about getting our luggage off, he forgot about his guitar. And here you have 20 buses that just passed us, okay? We don't know what bus we just came off of. And here goes, all of a sudden, we get all the luggage, and we're standing there, and he goes, oh, My guitar! And we didn't know, we didn't know the number of the bus. Three, four, five, ten buses already passed us. We have no idea. And I'm crying. I'm going, oh my gosh, he's worrying about my luggage and he just, they just lost his, his uh, guitar. I started to pray. He gets in a taxi cab and the taxis are 50 bucks. It doesn't matter if you go one mile. They're, they're just outrageous, okay? They're worse than New York. <clears throat> And so he gets in the taxi cab, okay, and, and he goes, and he's going to find this bus. And we're just praying, Lord, take him to the bus. Take him to the right bus. Just take him, supernaturally take him to the right bus. So about 15 minutes, you know, go by, maybe 20 minutes go by. All of a sudden, he comes back. He has the guitar. The taxi driver, the taxi, he didn't even know what number the bus was, okay? Totally impossible, the taxi driver didn't even charge him. See, that's a miracle. That's a miracle in itself. I'm telling you, God does miracles. I, they did this on a train. One day, the guys, they couldn't get their visas. They couldn't get their visas, and they were at the embassy. And we were already on the train, and we're sweating because we don't speak the language, and we need the boys, we need the ministry guys to be with us, and they're not there. And we're, 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 headed, back to, we're headed to Moscow. And guess what? The train takes off. None of the ministers, they were not there. And we're sweating bullets. We are, f we are fragile. I mean, we are just freaking out because we need, we don't, we don't know how to speak. We don't know when to get off. We don't know where we're going. They know all the itinerary. I don't know nothing I don't, because I don't understand anything. We're praying, we're praying. All of a sudden, and I'm the, the train is taken off. It's going, it's moving. And all of a sudden, we hear this coming down and they were sweating they were perspiring they just got their visas and got on that train just at the right time you know we serve a mighty god i'm telling you he goes before us to make the crooked path straight 
And you know, God wants to do miracles for you. He wants you to build miracles for you, but he wants to be first in your life. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Then all these things will be added unto you. We want to add all the things on, and then I'm going to be good to God. Then I'm going to serve God. Then I'm going to bless God. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. You see, it's important that we truly put our God, our Father, first in our lives. And it's just like the, fe- the, the, the baptism of the Spirit. You see, the feast... It's Passover. Well, what's Passover? It's salvation. Passover from death to life, okay? And then the second room is Pentecost. Pentecost is the baptism of the Spirit. Why? Because God sent his son to overcome our humanity of the curse that Adam implemented for, uh, to us. He implemented death. He implemented mortality because he chose to depend on his intellect. He chose to depend on his senses. He, told, he chose to depend on his way. And because he did, he brought death to you and me. God had no intentions of allowing us to die. It was a curse. But praise God, he sent his son because he loves you and me so much that he sent his son to overcome death so that you and I could overcome it. But the church doesn't understand that the feasts tell the story of overcoming death. And it's through the Holy Spirit. There's three rooms, but most of the church gets stuck on the second room in Pentecost. And they think, oh, it's the gifts of the Spirit. You know, you pray for people and they get healed. And that's it. No, the whole purpose is not about the gifts. That's the benefits. The purpose of being baptized in the Spirit is to grow up in the Spirit so that you're mind and your and the world and your senses don't rule you anymore and stress don't rule you anymore and you have a supernatural faith to take you beyond your flesh you see the veil was your flesh the veil is your carnal thinking the veil is your thoughts the veil is the world the veil is your works of working and depending on what you can do instead of what god has already done for you and so when we choose to die to our old man, the Adam, the old Adam. When we say, I don't want to live by the old Adam, I want to live by the last Adam. The Christ, he became the last Adam. Jesus became the last Adam. He overcame the first Adam. And he died that we could be just like him. And so when he died, he became spirit. And God consummated him in the heavens so that he could send the incorruptible seed, the incorruptible spirit into you and me so that his incorruptible seed, his spirit, would train us and teach us to be just like him. And when we, the more we spend in the spirit, it's like Steve, when he came up here, he started getting serious with God. You know, he was just happy making money, sending me overseas and being a good old boy, doing doing the good old thing. But then God got a hold of his heart and he started getting serious with the spirit. And now he has these visions and they blow me away of the detailed vision that God has given him because you have these treasures in you. But until you allow the Spirit to ignite you and train you and teach you, they won't come alive. They're dormant in you. But when you pray in the Spirit, when you cry out to God because He wants you're His children, and you know we're celebrating Mother's Day today, but God literally is our mother and our father. You know, He loves us. He's El Shaddai. That's feminine. You know, El Shaddai is fem- feminine, the nurturer. He nurtures us. But He's, but he's also Jehovah. He's also Elohim. He's also the mighty God, the everlasting Father. He's masculine. He's feminine because he was, he, in spirit, he's both. We were made. How can, how can Dennis be made in God's image and I be made in God's image? Apparently, God's both. He's masculine and he's feminine. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But it's in the spirit. It's in the realm of, it's in the, realm of the spirit that God's masculine. And he's feminine. He's a nurturer. He gives birth to life and resurrection. But guess what? He is the procreator. He wants to, pro- he wants to impregnate us with his word. And, and his word is be- we're being impregnated by the spirit of God. And as we 
or allow the spirit to impregnate us, we start to grow a baby. And the baby, the baby is the power of the Christ in us. And that baby overtakes our natural realm. It overtakes the physical realm. It overtakes our senses. It overtakes the things of the desires of our flesh and it removes them so that the spirit of God will rule and reign in our life and we can have joy and victory. Let me tell you something. It is not easy to raise children. It is not easy. to. They don't come out with a book. Come on. There is no book that comes out with them. And it's trial and error. But praise God. When we have God, we have his protection. It says, through the cleansliness of your hands, your loved ones will be saved. Your loved ones will be saved. But we have a responsibility to train our children so that they can learn of God at an early age so they don't make the same mistakes we make. Amen? How powerful. But I want to get to beyond the veil. The veil is your flesh. The veil is your senses. And through the veil, Jacob wrestled with God. Well, what does Jacob mean? Trickster, schemer, usurper of authority. He wrestled with God. Come on. And he gave up. And he became Israel. And you know what Israel means? God's now ruling. And that's what God, see, we're learning to give up our pride, our arrogance. We're learning to give up lust, perversion. We're learning to give up all these desires that keep us from knowing our God in his fullness so that he can bless us, guide us, direct us, and that our household can be blessed and flourish. Amen? And so Benjamin, I want to come to the, I, I didn't get too much time with this. We're already pretty well at the end. But ben, um, Joseph gave Benjamin 300 pieces of silver. This is a powerful message because silver means redemption. And 300, 300 is divine revelation, perfection, and completeness. God is giving his right-hand company perfection and completion because they are growing up as his right hand. Now I want to tell you what right hand means. <clears throat> I want to remind you that in Matthew 25, 34, it says, Then the king will say to those in his right hand, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit, take possession, Succeed as an heir of mine, the kingdom prepared for, for you from the foundation of the world. How powerful is that? God has, listen, all the patriarchs in Hebrew 11 are anxiously awaiting the redemption of their bodies. See, the church preaches, oh, you know, the world is going to hell and and and. There's going to be, you know, wars and, and, and um, we're going to go to heaven and be with Jesus. That's not what the Bible says. The Bi Listen to what Jesus told the disciples to pray and we will get truth. He told the disciples to pray, to pray that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on where? Earth as it is in heaven. God gave the earth to man. His purpose is in this earth. So he's going to have a people, a people of his right hand, a people that overcome, a people without spot or wrinkle, a people, come on, that put him first, that seek ye first the kingdom of God. He's going to have a people that's going to rule and reign with him in the earth as priests and kings. He taught the disciples, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Guess what else he told them to pray? He told them to pray that the knowledge, the knowledge, not our knowledge, God's knowledge, the knowledge of his glory, the knowledge of what we, it says that we fell short of the glory of God. Amen? Now listen to this scripture. He told the disciples to pray that the knowledge of his glory will fill the earth, will cover the earth. The knowledge of his glory. What we fall short of? And what was glory, right? 
Well, what is a church supposed to be doing in the earth? They are in Ephesians 3, um, uh, 4, in uh, 11 through 13, it says that the fivefold ministry, the hand of God, come on, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, the apostles, and the, the prophets are the hand of God to equip the church to what? To raise up a people in the full stature of a perfect man, Christ Jesus. <coughs> he wants to raise you up in perfection. Did you know that? Well, you say, I can't be perfect. No, you can't, and neither can I. But when I'm in Christ, when I'm thinking and I'm reading the word of God, when I'm praying in the spirit, I stop thinking in the natural realm. I stop thinking of my needs. I stop thinking of my desires. And I start to think like God. And the more I think like God, the more I'm discipled, the more I'm trained, the more I am like him. And one day, the things of this world do not control me anymore. One day, the material, you know, my son, he's here today, but but he says to mom, you know, mom, why don't you wear your, your jewelry anymore? Why don't you, you know, well, because I, don't, I have no desire for it anymore. I don't have nothing to prove to anybody anything. I'm free from it. I don't care. If you're going to love me, you're going to love me for me, not with what I have. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You know, um, uh, uh, years ago, uh, I had to have a Jaguar. I was determined to have a Jaguar. Why? Because I was insecure. I wanted to be hot. You know, I wanted to be cool, you know? Because that was a desire. But guess what? When I learned the revelation of God, I didn't have to have a car as a stigma for my identity. Come on. I want to stay away from stigmas. I want people to see Jesus. They don't need to see me. They need to see Jesus. You see, we get delivered all the time from everyday life. Come on, that we think is important. Are you hearing me? I know you're hearing me. I'm telling you a truth. You see, we're constantly being set free. Why? Because it's more important for me, the greatest gift as a mother, a greatest gift is to see her children following Jesus Christ, to see them grow up in him. You, I don't need anything but to see you grow up in Jesus. And that's my goal. My goal is to go to Moscow. My goal is to go to China. I just see those hurting people. Those, they're in slavery. You talk about works, people. We don't understand works unless you went to China. They live in these little cubby holes. Four and five in a family. 600 square feet. 600 square feet. They live. Their toilet, their kitchen, their beds are all in 600 square feet. And they don't complain. But they love Jesus Christ and they're crying out. God set us free. I can hear him just like the Israelites when they were in Egypt in bondage. God, don't forget about us. Don't forget about us. And, and Steve, God gave Steve a vision uh, a couple months ago, and, and, and uh, he saw the Chinese people praying but you know, they were praying and they identified us. They were praying. And what did they say, Steve? Did they say it that way? I just want to make sure I got it right. <clears throat> and they were saying, did they, were they praying for world outreach? They were praying for world outreach. You see, the more closer we get with Jesus, the more we care about others, the more impact we have on the earth. You want to make an impact just for you or you want to make an impact in the earth? I want to change lives for the glory of God. That's the greatest gift. The greatest gift is to see people transformed and changed for the glory of God. That's what a mother is. That's what we're celebrating today. But a mother is revealing the character of Christ, not building their kids in appearance and the love of money and the, and the lust of life. No, that's shallow. But giving people Jesus Christ that when, they're, when you're not there, Jesus is taking care of them. Amen? <coughs> I want to finish up with this. <clears throat> Joseph, symbolic of Christ, gave Benjamin, son of my right hand, 300 pieces of silver. He gave him divine revelation, perfection, and completeness of his full redemption. How powerful is that? 
And this is what, this is what Benjamin, I'm going to finish with this. I want to tell you that the right hand is the extension of the head Christ Jesus as his instruments, as a channel of power and authority in the earth to carry out and execute his purpose in the earth. Now, I'm going to leave you with Genesis 49, 17. Benjamin, son of my right hand, shall raven. The word raven means to tear in pieces, to pulverize, destroy a wolf. The wolf is symbolic of the beastly, carnal nature of man. It is symbolic of the teachings of man's systems of false religious doctrines that keep men in bondage. And in the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. How powerful is that? This is what, this is the power that's in you. You see, when we get in the spirit, we have the power to destroy principalities and powers. We have the power to take out the cobra over China. We have the power to take out the cobra over America. Why? Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the earth. Because I have heard what God wants to do. And when we hear what God wants to do, we can pray it. But we just can't pray things just to be praying them. You see, when we come to church, we just pray, pray, pray. But, but God wants to, us to connect with the heavens. Someone real quick look up, um, I think it's Hosea 2.21, and we'll end there. But it's so powerful because God wants us to be Benjamins. He wants us to add to him, add to Christ. Joseph is Christ, and God's adding his army. He's bringing forth his army of those who wants to go beyond the veil into the Holy of Holies and become one with Christ. Amen? And it's powerful. Does somebody have it? Hosea 2. Yeah. Yeah. So what is God saying? He is saying that when we pray and we seek the face of God and we hear from God, he's going to respond to the earth. The heavens are going to respond to our earth and we're going to see prayers answered for the glory of God. Amen? Stand with me. God is good. Amen? He has a plan. He has a mighty plan. Amen?